welcome back to The Pew, everybody. I am your host, John Edwards, and I'm excited to bring you another bonus episode of Just a Guy in the Pew. I've got a great guest this week, and as you know, when we have these bonus episodes, it's usually when we bring on some of the friends we've met in ministry and in the Catholic world, and especially try to bring on guys that have you know, poured into me or, or have a great message to be able to share with folks. And today is certainly a great example of that. I'm really honored to to welcome back to the show a great friend in my life, uh, Matthew Leonard. If you recall, Matthew came on the show, I guess, about a year ago and shared with us about the forms of prayer and the types of prayer. So many folks had written in and said they struggle with, you know, their contemplation and their 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 vocal prayer and just the different ways to enter into a conversation with God. And Matthew, that was one of my favorite episodes, and and people have commented on that still till today. And so it's I'm glad to bring you back, but. Matthew, before we get you started, I just want to tell people a little bit about you. If you don't know who Matthew Leonard is, he's a Catholic author and a speaker. He's a filmmaker. He's the founder of the Science of Sainthood, which is an online platform where he helps Catholic rad- Catholics radically transform their spiritual lives and grow towards sainthood. He also has an amazing podcast uh, called The Art of Catholic. But as I said in the beginning, the important thing to me is he's a really awesome guy that gives me time in his life and has been a blessing to me and my family. So, Matthew, it's great to have you again, and welcome to the show. It's great to be back in the pew, Johnny. Good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you, too. Uh, it was a little different last time. I liked you so much, I got rid of my hair and uh, tried to <laughs> emulate you so that now people get the best of both worlds. Two bald guys just sharing a conversation, right? <laughs> yeah, we could, we could start a podcast called that, just a couple of bald guys in the pew. There you go. There you go. Well, man, I know you've been busy. You and I have talked a lot. I know you went and did a lot of men's conferences and you're continuing to do parish missions and all that great work. And, you know, Matthew, I, I tell you, one of the things that I love about you is just how you help people find their way in this, uh, into the spiritual life. It can be so hard to grow. Um, and as I mentioned, like we, we spent an episode talking about prayer and that in itself can be a long conversation, but just growth in the spiritual life. You know, we have so many everyday guys that, that listen to our show and women, a lot of women that listen to our show too. And a lot of the, the questions I get all the time are, how do I progress? You know, like, I feel like I'm just going through the motions. I feel like I'm not growing. I feel like when I do take a step forward, I, I, I slide 10 steps back. Um, and I don't really understand how to move to a, to the next level in my faith, you know? And one guy even said, you know, the faith to me seems like it's supposed to be a cobblestone road. And and you step from one stone to the next as you're wa- working your way from A to Z, right? From where I am to hopefully heaven and eternity with our Father forever. But I just have trouble struggling and you know, figuring out how to move past the point where I am and how to grow in my holiness. So, you know, today I just wanted to open that up and just invite you to speak to a little bit of that because I know you spend so much of your time talking about those things. Yeah, you know, when I discovered the church's tradition on how to make progress in the spiritual life. That's when the kind of the training wheels came off of my Catholicism in a lot of ways, because as a convert, you come in and you have all these amazing tools at your disposal. We have this tradition of prayer. We have the sacraments. We have all of these things, intercession of the saints. And we do these things. And lots of times it feels like we're just treading water. And part of the problem we have is we're always comparing ourselves to other people, which is a bad move. Like, don't do yeah. that. You know, you don't want to look <laughs> at other people. You know, you want to deal with your relationship with, with the Lord one-on-one. But the church does provide a road for us. And and I'm not talking about, you know, going to mass and saying your prayers and getting the confession every now and then. Those are the vehicle. But that vehicle travels a particular path. And this is what the spiritual writers in the history of the church call the three stages or the three ages of the interior life. And this goes all the way back in the tradition of the church to well, you find you find it in sacred scripture, even uh, a lot of the spiritual writers will talk about stages shown in, in sacred scripture. But Evagrius Ponticus and St. Dionysius and Gregory of Nyssa and Clement of Alexandria, Aquinas, Augustine, all these guys. And of course, John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, they all lay out the path that we're supposed to follow. And most Catholics, frankly, are just unaware that this stuff even exists. Yeah. And when I found it, I was like, holy moly, this changes everything because it, it's kind of like a spiritual GPS uh, to mm-hmm. get to God. And you got to kind of, the, the point of it is you have to have some idea of where you are. Well, actually, let me back up. What you first have to understand is you're on your way to someplace. Like we're not mm-hmm. just supposed to exist, right? Uh, we're actually supposed to progress in this life because there's a specific destination. And so there's a specific path for us to lay laid out for us to get there. 
And once you realize, wait, I'm supposed to make progress toward an end goal, then you're like, what's the road? And the church calls this road the three ages or the three stages of the spiritual life. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's something I found too early on when I started really dialing into my faith. And it opened up a lot of doors for me because I, I just, I felt like I was just in the same place, as you said, sort of treading water and, and, and running the same circle like a dog chasing my tail, right? But um, <laughs> when I found some of these people that you're talking about, like St. Teresa of Avila, and I believe she talks about the seven mansions, right? Isn't that what she... Yeah, yeah. So she, Teresa of Avila, for those of you who don't know, she's a 16th century mystic, Spanish mystic. She's a doctor of the church. In fact, she's the doctor of prayer. And so mm. she has this vision from God, and she writes this out in her most famous work, which is called The Interior Castle. And so I mentioned the three stages or three ages of the spiritual life, and I'll tell you what those are in just a second. Sure. But Teresa of Avila lays it out a little bit differently in her seven her seven um, mansions of the interior castle. So she has this vision from the Lord where she sees the human soul as this crystal globe that's got these different mansions in it. And instead of being one after the other in kind of a linear fashion, the way a man would lay it out, she said mm -hmm. some are above, some are below, some are to the side. But in the center mansion, that seventh mansion is where God resides, the, the king of glory. And the most secret things pass between God and the soul. And so a, a soul basically makes progress from one mansion to the next as you mature in the spiritual life. And that's a huge point because we don't, we don't think about the fact that we're supposed to mature. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes we kind of get lost in the verbiage of, you know, unless you're a child, you know, you can never enter the kingdom of God. Well, that doesn't mean we stay spiritual infants. It means sure. we become guileless like a child. We're innocent like a child. But you get that by maturing in the faith. So you move from a spiritual infancy into an adolescence and into a spiritual adulthood. So the same way you grow up in the natural life, you grow up in this in the supernatural life, in the spiritual life. And so we're supposed to make progress. And Teresa's is really, it's a really easy way to visualize how you make progress. And going back to our previous conversation, John, the way that she says you even get into your interior castle uh, is by prayer. Uh, particularly meditative prayer. You can't separate prayer and growth in the spiritual life because they're part and parcel of the same thing. Sure. Well, as we're talking about this, you know, where do we start? So I know there's three stages of the spiritual life, as yeah. you said. So let's get into that lay, and talk a little right. bit about where we begin. Sure. Let me just lay it out in, in summary for you. So you have your first conversion, right? You are in a debauched life and all of a sudden you have this massive conversion. You come into the faith, you're like, woohoo, right? You're in the yeah. purgative way, it's called. So the three stages are the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive ways. So again, just think of those as spiritual infancy, adolescence, and adulthood. The purgative way is basically what it sounds like. You're being purged of all your big sin, like all the bad stuff you were doing before that you still have a tendency to. That's where God is, you know, cleaning that stuff out of your system because you got to get mm -hmm. clean right before you can get healthy. And so sure. it's kind of like a spiritual colon cleanse. And so you get rid of all <laughs> of this junk in your life and, and you got to start. And again, you have to have a life of prayer, like right from the get go. If you don't have a life of prayer right now, guys, ladies do start today. You have to today, like st just take 15 minutes and just be with the Lord. That's part of how you make progress through the purgative way. And what happens is. Uh, you start to get rid of these things in your life through the grace of the Lord and practicing, you know, asceticism. Uh, you know, you start doing a little bit of fasting here and there and you start to make time for prayer. And then you come to a transition point. And this is when uh, newbies in the spiritual life suddenly freak out a little bit because they're doing all the things they thought they were supposed to do. And all of a sudden they don't feel the presence of God like they used to. Yeah. Like dryness starts to hit a little bit. And you're like, wait a minute. Like, what happened, God? I thought we had something going on here, right? Sure. And, and suddenly you don't feel him. And what's happening is he's not getting further away from you. What he's doing is, is inviting you higher. And so the way I kind of describe this is if you, if you think about your soul as an upstairs and a downstairs of a house, early on in the spiritual life, you're living in the downstairs. 
It's a nice co- you know, sofa down there. You're chilling out and you're, you're relying on your senses, right? How I feel about my faith. And I just really felt the presence of the Lord, you know, and that's all real. That's all good, but you can't base your faith on that. And so what happens is God starts to move up the stairs a little bit and he's inviting us to go into the higher level, the spiritual part of our soul where the yeah. intellect and the will are. Okay. So you don't feel his presence because he's kind of going upstairs in your soul. And people at this point sometimes will freak out a little bit because they don't feel his presence. And the spiritual writers basically say, just keep going. You just keep showing up to prayer. And as you persevere, you will then eventually make your way into the second stage of the spiritual life, which they call the illuminative way. And it's called that because we are then more illuminated by the light and love of Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, right? And so this is when you start to focus on deeper sins, you know, uh, vanity pride. Uh, I, I want to grow in humility. How do I do that? And so you're a little more dialed in, uh, so to speak, uh, to your spiritual life at this point in time. And it, it lasts for different amounts of time uh, for different people, because it depends on, you know, how'd you come into the spiritual life? How much baggage did you have? What did you yeah, have to get through? Exactly, yeah. right? A lot of us had a lot of luggage. So Uh, in this second stage, you kind of, um, you focus more on the interior life, your prayer life starts to grow more and more deep. You're spending more and more time with the Lord and you desire to, right? Because this is what you're made for. And so you begin to desire it more. And then eventually, as you make your way through the illuminative stage, you come to another transition point, which St. John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul. And a lot of people have heard of that and it freaks them out. This is where you sure. kind of feel the <laughs> abandonment by, by God. This is when you're like Mother Teresa because she had this for like 40 years and that's not normal. But you don't feel God's presence at all. And now he's fully upstairs in your soul and he's inviting you completely to come upstairs. So you don't have a sensation of his presence at all. And once mm-hmm. you p- pass through that, you keep doing what you're supposed to do in this spiritual life, always showing up like that's key. You have to always show up. Once you pass through that, you end up in the unitive way. And that's like the final stage in the, in the, uh, the spiritual life on this side of heaven, where you're really united to the Lord in a deep way, kind of like how, you know, uh, lovers are united in the conjugal embrace. That's how, kind of how they describe it. You're more unified with our Lord. And that's about the, the, the most intense relationship can get with the Lord before you are fully unified with him in heaven. So that's kind of the, the overall, like from 10,000 feet, the three stages of spiritual life. Yeah, well, I think we ought to give a, per, a, a public service announcement that unlike uh, a physical colon cleanse, you don't have to wait till you're 45 to have your spiritual <laughs> colon cleanse. <right? laughs> you need to start way earlier than that, right? <laughs> you do, yeah. Don't don't wait till middle age. You, in fact, right. the sooner you start it, the, the better you're going to be. Trust me. Uh, no, start That's it young. Right. There's some young. There's some young guys watching this. Don't wait. Don't wait. Start now. It makes it so much better. And you can not that you necessarily have can go so much further than than old guys, because you know what? It is never too late to start. You jump into the spiritual life and the Holy Spirit takes over and you have no idea where he's going to take you. But, you know, you're going to go up and that's where you want to go. Well, and and, and to your point, too, you don't want to wait because, I mean, look, we have a responsibility as fathers, as husbands to bring our families along. So. You know, I can't tell you how many how many people, Matthew, and men that I've talked to at men's conferences that are, you know, older men that that didn't dial into their faith until later, and you know, they have children that don't that aren't in the faith. They, you know, they didn't have the the time and the memories with them that they probably would have had if they were dialed into more of that than just kind of head down and work and doing the stuff the world tells us to do. So yeah, you make a good point. And, and another thing you said that I want to go back to too is you know you were talking about. Uh, in the purgative way, you know, it was all about feelings, you know, I, I believe is the area you talked about that. And that's something that's been important for me to learn in my own spiritual life is, you know, it, it is hard when you've been used to feeling God, and then all of a sudden, you don't feel that presence. And uh, you can get caught up in that pretty quickly. And the devil can start to work in those things and those emotions. And, you know, we we're, we live in a society these days where we want to feel this and feel that and it preys on emotion and tries to get you to live based on your feelings and your emotions. But, you know, we're called to live the truth. And some of the best advice I ever got from my spiritual director was I was in there one time and just kind of, it was after I started the ministry or God started through us and was in involved in it and, you know, trying to get it to follow the path he wanted me to. 
And I remember going in there and like, but I just don't feel this and I don't feel this way and I don't feel that way. And finally he was like, John, it's not about feelings. It's about truth. It's about truth. Do you believe that God's called you to do this? Do you believe that God wants this with your life? Do you believe if you believe in those things and you believe them to be the truth and quit worrying about your feelings and move on? Yeah. You know, this is a great point because this is where a lot of people get hung up, John, not just in terms of trying to discern the Lord's will or, you know, what am I supposed to do and this and that, but the spiritual writers talk about how early on in the purgative way, God will give these things called spiritual consolations to various people. Not everybody gets them. And some people get them more than other people. And these are kind of like little tastes of you know, like little pieces of candy that are just a foretaste of what it is that he has for you later. And these are good. We don't want to negate the the beauty and the the God given nature of our feelings, right? Because as Catholics, we're a union. We know we're embodied persons. We're a union of body and soul. And so we want to feel things, right? We just don't want to rely on our feelings. So spiritual consolations are a good thing. They come from God. Typically, they come when you're praying. So maybe it's this deep sense of peace that you get when you're praying. Maybe you have a, an actual palpable sensation of the burning presence of the Holy Spirit. There are all kinds of ways that it can happen. And again, most of the time it happens when you're praying. The problem that a lot of people have is they put the emphasis on this because they think, oh my goodness, I have arrived. I am feeling the presence of God and this is sure. awesome, right? <laughs> and so you start to focus on those and you want those. I, I remember before I became Catholic, when I would go to some of these spiritual conferences, uh, there was a guy that I, I met who literally was so intoxicated with these, these kind of consolations that he sold everything he had just about. And he put his wow. remaining belongings in, in a station wagon and piled his kids in the car. And they went from conference to conference to conference, like they were following the Grateful Dead or something, just so they could <laughs> kind of experience that spiritual high because he lost the forest for the trees. See, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, I, I talked to you about how we start to feel dryness. John mm -hmm. of the Cross calls this the night of sense, right? So it's God beginning to kind of, um, it's like he's anesthetizing you, uh, like a doctor, like when you go in for a surgery, you know? And so, He's kind of putting you under a little bit because he's going to teach us not to rely upon those lower senses, those emotions and such. Yeah, I made you feel really good. That's what's coming. But that's just a foretaste of what's coming. Let me do a little bit of deeper surgery on you. And so I'm going to take my sense away from you a little bit. You need to keep doing the stuff that you're doing. You need to keep praying. You need to keep seeking after me. Keep seeking that truth you were talking about, John. And let me work more deeply in your life and prepare you for more. And that's really what the transition transition stages are. He's preparing us for more of himself. And he's got to do that because our house is in such disorder. So he's kind of cleaning it up and getting it ready. And so then you move from stage to stage. He's he's just preparing the way so that we can move more into a, a deep and fuller life with him. Well, I, th I think this is another moment in my own sp spiritual life where I grew some was, was I started looking at basically what you're talking about is the withdrawal of God in the way like God never withdraws from us, but that feeling of withdrawal you're talking about is it's very easy to look at it. Like, well, why did God do this to me? Right? Like, why did he call me to them and then move away? Right. Is what we kind of perceive is, you know, why did he leave me here like this? And, and we can sort of look at it like God is doing something to us, like something negative instead of allowing us that, that opportunity to grow. And when I started to understand that, it's like the same question of why do we suffer? You know, why do we suffer? Is it God allowing us to suffer? Is it God making us suffer? Is, you know, but what I started to figure out was it was those moments of suffering that allow us to take the next step forward. You know, it almost allows us to see and, and really begs the question, you know, who are we going to be when things get a little tougher, when things get more difficult, right? It's, it's easy to pray when you're in consolations, right? When the birds are chirping and you're running through the tulips and the sun's up and, you know, the sound of music's playing in the background or whatever and life's doing well. <laughs> but when you get hit with these, you know, these things that happen in life, when life hits you in the face, you know, those are the times where, where we really see, you know, where we are and what we're made of and what we're, how we're going to react. And I think, you know, what I, what I always ask men to, to really look at is not to look at this as, it's sort of why did God abandon me or why did God leave me or why did God allow this, but more of what is God inviting me into? And it, it just draws into that picture of what you said of trying to 
almost like he's standing on those stairs looking down at you saying, come on this way, come a little bit higher, come closer. Yeah, we want to draw some distinctions because it's a couple of different things. There's, you know, you mentioned suffering, right? And so there's God's mm-hmm. permissive will where things, because sure. God never causes suffering, okay? He doesn't yeah, cause a amen. suffering. We cause, you know, it's, that's because of sin. That's how, that's how suffering came into the world and death. God may allow it in our lives according to his, what's called his permissive will, sure. because he knows he can always draw a greater good out of it, right? Romans eight twenty eight. we know that all things work to the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. So that's why we can always abandon ourselves to him, even when we're experiencing that suffering. In the spiritual life, when you have a, a similar kind of sensation almost of that suffering, uh, realize it's a different ball game because... God is doing something to you directly. It's not him allowing something. He is doing something directly. And the analogy that John of the cross uses is that of the sun. He says, you know, if you, if you look at the sun, it blinds you, not because it's not bright, because it's so bright, you don't have the senses to be able to look at it, right? And that's yeah. the same thing that happens in the spiritual life. When you start to feel that dryness and you kind of get depressed and you're like, God being like, where'd you go? Realize he's actually gotten closer to you, but you haven't developed the senses yet to see how close he is, right? And so what happens is as you continue to mature, you start to rely more on your upstairs senses where your intellect and will are instead of your senses. And I know I'm getting a little technical here, but that, that's the metaphysics behind this. You start to see more with your spiritual senses instead of your physical senses, right? Your feelings. And so now you start to see, oh, he didn't go farther away. He's actually gotten closer to me. And then the more your eyes are opened, the more you then understand the light of Jesus Christ. In fact, Gregory of Nyssa was one who really kind of opened my eyes, so to speak, to this. He talks about the luminous darkness of God. Because we think about in terms of moving toward the light, right? I'm moving toward the light. It's got to get brighter and brighter. Heaven is a glory, beatific vision, and all the rest of that. <laughs> and Gregory of Nyssa has a totally different ball game. He says, no, it's, it's you moving into a, a kind of a darkness, at least what you see as darkness in the beginning. And, and the, uh, the kind of analogy that I use is like, imagine if you're, you're in your house, you just bought a new house, and you're in the upstairs and you see like a trap door and you're like, oh, there's an attic, you know? And so you pop the, the, the door on the attic, you throw your ladder up and you look up and it's all black. You're like, oh man, what's up there? So you go up there and as soon as your head gets over the top and you're looking around, all of a sudden your eyes adjust and you can start to see what's there, right? That's kind of what happens in the spiritual life. And then you're like, wait a minute, there's another floor above this one. There's a trap door going up there. So you take your ladder and you go and you set it up there and you pop the door and you go up, man, it looks really black up there. And this happens over and over and over. The the higher you go, it looks dark in the beginning, but your eyes start to adjust because you're being more illuminated by the light of Jesus Christ. That's what it's like in the prayer life as well. And your spiritual life, you don't feel him for a while. And then after a while, you begin to again, because your senses have adjusted to the fact that he's much closer to you than he was before. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's a great analogy. That's one thing I love about what you do, Matthew, is you take things that if somebody just picked up a book and dove into it, would probably find hard, confusing, uh, would would have trouble understanding it. But you take things and it's one of your gifts. You're able to to draw images and, and draw people into into a place to where you're not simplifying the teaching, but you're making it more uh, reachable and more understandable for people. And that's why I love to have you on because this stuff is, you know, if you've just come into the faith or even if you've been cradle Catholic your whole life and you just kind of stumble on this stuff, you're going like, what, what is this? And like you said, dark night of the soul. It's like, is Darth Vader going to show up? Like, what's gonna, you know, like that's what's true. Gonna, you know, the lightsabers, you know, like what's going to happen here? And, and you're so right. That's why I love what you do. And I think so many people should go and check out your work because that's your gift, man. Like that's your gift is taking something that's, that's, uh, that that's complicated. That is, uh, maybe hard to understand when you're, you know, first stumbling upon it and making it, you know, attainable and reachable and understandable for people. And that's why I love your science of sainthood, uh, you know, program you've got going on there with your, I mean, how many videos do you have in the thing now? Like 200 and something. I don't know. There's 20 courses up there right now, these short videos. And you see, this is the thing. The Lord, I mean, I'm a low wattage bulb. And so I've got to figure <laughs> out a way to make this make sense to me. And that's how sure. I hopefully make it, you know, help make uh, sense to other people. <laughs> I think, you know, if someone's watching this and they're like, they've never heard anything about the three stages of the spiritual life before. And, you know, to be honest, 
when I go around and I poll people when I'm, I'm traveling and speaking, five to seven percent of Catholics have ever heard of this. And I'm talking about people yeah. been in the church all their lives. And it took me years before I came across this stuff, even after I've been Catholic. Right. And I read my way into the church. So don't be you know, don't be like, man, what, what? I've never heard of this stuff before. This is something that's deep in the tradition of the church. Uh, this is something that we need to know about because we have to make progress in the spiritual life. And it's the map that shows you how to make progress in the spiritual life. But the important thing is to, in order to make progress is a, you keep doing the basics of what is right according to your vocation and your state in life. Yeah. A, you have to have the life of prayer. You, if you're a, if you're a father of a family, you just you got to take care of your kids to the best of your ability. You do your best to transmit the faith. You get to mass as often as you possibly can, right? And I mean, build your life around it because the liturgy uh, isn't something we should be fighting over, which happens way too much online. Sure, the liturgy yeah. is the the summit of the activity to which the church is you know is directed. Like it, and the, the catechism says it's the font from which all her power flows. So you want power to be able to make progress in the spiritual life, it comes through the, the faith. It comes through the sacrament of sacraments wedded to a life of prayer. You have to have the Eucharist as often as you can possibly get it. So get there. But you do these basics and let the Lord do what the Lord's going to do. But you need to know what's going to happen to you because it, like, if you didn't have any idea and you get to this dryness in prayer, you're like, well, I must be doing something wrong. And the worst yep. thing you can do is stop. Right. You got to just keep going forward one foot in front of the other. You know, it, think of it as like a, a tide of the ocean. You know, it kind of goes in and it flows back and it goes in and it comes back. But it's making progress the whole time, even though you might not notice it immediately. And so that's kind yeah. of what our spiritual lives are like. You have to just stick with the basics and the Holy Spirit will continue to guide you. But but educate yourself as to what it is. Yeah, and that's you're, that's so true. I mean, that is the spiritual battle. We hear that talked about all the time: is spiritual battles and spiritual warfare. And and right in the heart of that is what you just said. I mean, we're going to have those moments where we don't feel God, where we feel like all our efforts are falling on deaf ears and nothing's happening. And there's a choice in that moment. I mean, the devil's waiting on that moment. He's waiting to lead you away from God. Well, you might as well quit. Not getting any better, right? You don't feel anything. All of the things we've talked about here. But yet God is inviting you to more. But you have to, as you said, train those senses to be able to see that and to be able to understand that. And what I love about the, the three stages of spiritual life is, you know, it's not just one person that talked about this. There's so many of, of the saints that came before us and they might have called it mansions or this or that. But the beauty of it, what really opened my eyes was there is truth in this because God has brought so many people to this from so many different places in time and so many different angles. And while, yes, they're using different language and different ways to describe it, they are talking about the same thing. And that's one thing that I love about our faith is that these truths, you see people from all over the place basically giving the same message. And if that's the case, then there's someone that's drawing all those people to that message and he wants it heard. Yeah, you know, this tripartite or this three-step process of the faith really comes back to the Trinity, right? That's why there are three yeah. stages of the spiritual life. It's, everything's Trinitarian in our faith. It always comes back to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, you can even think about this. Um, writers will talk about how there are three ages in the entire history of the world, so to speak. So you have the age of nature, and that's from creation to the time of Moses. And then there's the age of the law, where you go from Moses until the time of Jesus Christ. And then you have the age of grace. And the three persons of the Holy Spirit, um, um, Holy Trinity, I mean, will fit these different stages. So the Father is kind of that first stage, the age of nature. And, and you, it's that Father figure you're dealing with the, the natural thing, so to speak. And then you're the Son with the age of, of the law and the age of grace is the Holy Spirit. And so everything's tripartite. Everything's a movement more deeply into the Trinitarian light and love of Jesus Christ. And going back to something you said with regard to you know struggle with the devil and you know demonic activity and things like that we love to, to hear you know people like exorcists talk about demonic warfare you know spiritual sure. warfare and all the rest of this kind of stuff right our special fulton, fulton sheen said look don't think there's a demon behind every rock there's one behind every other rock but every one of those other rocks the the real struggle in the spiritual life 
yes, we wrestle, you know, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power, St. Paul says. But the, the, the struggle that we have most often is with ourselves, yeah, right? It's yeah. getting over our own tendencies and our own weaknesses. And yes, it's a spiritual struggle, but we have to stop looking at the stars, so to speak, and go, you know what? I need to get my rear end out of bed and I need to go down and pray right now. And I don't want to blame it on the devil if I don't get up. No, get yourself up out of bed sure. and go downstairs <laughs> and seek the Lord. You know, sure. it, it's kind of like you got to become kind of a Marine of the spiritual life. And, and it's not that grace isn't helping you. God's grace is always there to propel you forward. And my, it, could there be some demonic activity? Yeah, there could be. But stop looking at that stuff and just go yeah. do what you need to do. Right. Why? Because you love Jesus Christ and you want to be saved and you want your family to be saved as well. Amen. I mean, there's always accountability on our part. I mean, that's the thing. Nobody's going to do it for you. And, right. you know, if you're going to grow in your faith, you have to put in the work. I mean, that's just part of it. And you have to do those things when it's hard. I mean, there's, you know, somebody was telling me the other day, I don't have time to pray or I don't have time to come to a men's group or I don't have time. And it's, you know, I guarantee you when I when on Sunday afternoon, just like my phone, uh, iPhone's going to pop up. And so you spent 19 million hours a day on your phone, you know, for an average of blah, 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 blah. It's like you have time in your life, right? It's just what are you prioritizing right. and where are you putting that time? And and I can tell you one thing, you know, in my experience, Matthew, whenever my life seems to go sideways, whenever it seems like the world's crashing in on something, it's usually if I'm being honest with myself, I've gotten lax on the things that I know I need to do. It's been a few days since I've been, I've gone to mass uh, I've rushed to get a shower because I, I hit the alarm a couple times instead of hitting my knees first thing in the morning and thanking God that I got another day to serve him. You know, it, it's, it's been several weeks since I've gone to adoration. When's the last time I've been to confession? All those things, if I really am being honest with myself and I stop trying to point the finger at situations and people and circumstances, you're right. It usually, if I'm being honest with myself, that finger starts to slowly turn and point back at me that I'm in that situation because I've simply stopped doing the things that I know I need to do to be the man that I claim I want to be. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why having a plan of life is so important for making progress in the spiritual life. Like you need to say, based on my schedule, this is when I'm going to pray. This is when I'm going to set time to do this. And I'm going to do X, Y, and Z every day so that I can and you have to have a schedule I mean, because if you don't, sure. we all know, you know, you're just, it's going to fall off because we think that other things are more important than our spiritual lives, you know, even working out or whatever. I'm not saying that, you know, getting physically fit isn't important. I could probably use some more working out myself, but at the end of the day, which one of our lives is going to last? Is mm -hmm. God really going <laughs> to care about how many inches are on my bicep? I mean, give me a break. It's our spiritual life is the one that lasts for all eternity. And it's going to dictate where it is that we go. And how close we are to Jesus Christ or far away. And so we need, really need to focus on that and not allow those things to go off. And when they do, when you, when you step back and you're like, oh, man, I really dropped the ball. I haven't been to mass enough. I haven't been to adoration. I haven't said my prayers, whatever. Okay. Then say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me. You throw yourself into the arms of divine mercy and you pick yourself back up again and you do it again. You just get back on my horse. That's all there is to it. You don't get down on yourself. You just go back and you do it again, realizing that God's your father. Like yeah. legit, <laughs> he really is your father. And, and he loves you perfectly. And perfect love drives out all fear, as John says. And so you don't have to you know, get down on yourself. Just say, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Father. Here I am again, you know? And, and then you move on again. Just like we wouldn't hammer our kids, you know, incessantly for, for failing or whatever, especially with a contrite heart. The Lord's never going to turn away from that. He's always sure. going to be standing there like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. So don't get down on yourself. Just give yourself back over to the Lord and get back up on the horse. Amen. Well said, man. <laughs> I think we that that's something to pray with for those out there that aren't looking at God as a father. That's something that will really help you grow just in that. If you start to understand that he is a loving father, that he is waiting for you and he doesn't you know he's not sitting there he's not a cosmic police officer writing down all the mistakes you made in your life waiting to punish you he's he's a father that just wants you to turn back so you can see his love right and you can feel his right. love and 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 that's that's a huge important part well matthew like here towards the end i, I really want to i know there's probably people that are in different stages right now in the spiritual life you know you're gonna there's lots of different folks that listen to this some some super formed people some people that are trying to figure it out some people that are in the middle so 
back to your image of the staircase. So let's say you're in the purgative way. You're trying to move up to the illuminative way. Or is it? Did I mess that up? Is it yep, yep. You're way? right. No, you're right. Yeah, okay. second stage is a limited way. You're right. <laughs> yep. All right. So you're moving there, and then you're going to the last stage. You know the steps from there. So, you know, go through real quick. If you're walking in, transitioning those stages, some things they could do uh, to continue to moving up those stairs that you talked about. Well, you don't have to do anything differently. See, that's sure. the thing. So you start in your life of prayer in that purgative way, and you have to develop your meditative life of prayer. That's a number one. All right, so meditative prayer, as we talked about in your last show, this is you, you know, like, you know, getting your Bible or a book and you're reading slowly through it. And I'm just using the books as an example, but you can use sure. anything to pray. Um, you, you develop this interior relationship with the Lord. It's quiet prayer. You're doing that regularly every day. Okay. That's a number one. And if you've never done it before, start with 15 minutes. And what you'll see as time goes by, you will do it more and more and more because you're going to want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're not doing anything differently. You're getting to the sacraments. Okay. Your Eucharist, confession, you're saying your prayers. What you need to be aware of is what's going to happen to you as a result, as the Lord moves you more deeply. Right. So you're going to experience those dry patches. And when you hit those dry patches, you keep at it. Okay. You don't change what it is that you were doing. Your devotions might change. Okay. So what's going to happen is, is like when you're in your life of prayer, you're doing your meditative prayer. You, you might uh, come to this point in time when you're like, I don't feel like reading this book anymore. And this is, a, this is typically in the transition from the first to the second stage from the purgative to the illuminative. You're like, I'm doing my meditations every day. And all of a sudden you're going to have this urge to just kind of stop and just be with the Lord. Like you don't want to talk. You don't want to read. You want to do anything, but just kind of be with the Lord. A lot of people make the mistake of squashing this and they'll just keep reading. They'll keep plowing through. They'll keep doing what it is that they were doing before. Don't do that. Like allow the Holy Spirit to move. Just be with the Lord. And it doesn't matter. You might even get distracted in the middle of that. I'm not saying you're like levitating or something. You just kind of want to be with the Lord and hang out, you know? And so do it, allow that to happen. And it'll happen only for short amounts of time in the beginning. Okay. These are like little nudges and they might last for only a little bit of time. And when the, the feeling kind of goes away, just go back to your meditation. This will become more and more frequent as time goes by. This is the Lord preparing you to move into contemplative prayer which kind of corresponds to your movement into the second stage of the spiritual life. So the more you move into contemplative prayer, the Lord is acting more and more on you in your prayer life, and he's drawing you into that more upstairs relationship at the same time. But you don't have to do anything differently except try to be tuned into the Holy Spirit and kind of obey the nudges as you feel them. And I know people are like, well, how do I know? Well, this is why spiritual directors are so important, right? I mean, Amen. like real, legit formed spiritual directors. Uh, and I know they're really hard to find. This is frankly one of the reasons why I founded the Science of Sainthood. Like, because people don't have other people telling them what's going to happen, right? And that's what the sure. Science of Sainthood is basically all about. And uh, in fact, priests used to be trained in this stuff, John. And most, you don't see it in seminaries very much anymore. So they're not trained to be spiritual directors and they weren't formed in this stuff. And this is one of the things that I've discovered. It's starting to happen again, thanks be to God. But for us individually, you just keep doing those things. The Lord's going to act on you more and more deeply. And you may experience different things as you continue to do the same basic things in your life. Right. So in the second stage of the spiritual life, you know how you read in the saints about how they have these crazy things that happen, like bilocating and are levitating oh, and all sure, the rest of this yeah. kind of stuff. You know, <laughs> well, you're probably levitating right now because you're so holy, John. But <laughs> yeah, what, th- this is typically that's not even in the third stage. Most of the time it's at the end of the second yeah. stage. It's before you go through the dark night of the soul that a lot of that stuff happens. And so you might have, you know, you might have spiritual phenomena happen to you. Don't bank on it. And don't hang your hat on it, right? Yeah. The Lord's going to deal with you differently because we all follow the same trajectory in the spiritual life, but every one of us is an individual child in the care of a mm-hmm. father who knows us better than we know ourselves. And so he knows exactly what it is that we need on an individual basis in order to grow up in the faith. So he's going to deal with John Edwards differently than he's going to deal with Matthew Leonard. And if Matthew yeah. Leonard doesn't need or does need something, he's going to give it to me or not give it to me. Right. Just like a parent deals with individual children in his family because, you know, they're all different. 
Okay. So you don't want it. That's it goes back to something we said at the beginning. Don't compare yourself to other people just because someone else is experiencing something doesn't mean you're necessarily going to, when you get to that stage, but you'll know that you are maturing and, but you always just continue to do the basics of the faith and let the Lord do with you what he will. And that's really all you need to, to remember, abandon yourself into the arms of God, because really, if you step back, what the spiritual life is really ordered to is us learning more and more and more to be like Jesus Christ, who said, not my will, but thine be done. The more we can do that, the more you're growing up in the spiritual life. And <laughs> sorry, you had me in a trance, man. I was just listening to that. that was powerful, <laughs> dude. I mean, that's, that's the truth. And, and this is where I go ahead. You're going to say something. No, I mean, th this is, in fact, St. Maximus, the confessor says that that's the pivotal moment in our salvation. This is why it's so important for us to understand the union of our will with Christ's. St. Maximus says that that was the moment that our salvation was won. Like all the other things that you hear about that we, that we celebrate, like going through Lent and, and Easter with this passion, death, his resurrection and ascension, certainly the cross is pivotal, right? It's the, the sure. central point, but all of those things take place because of the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus united his human will to the will of the Father and the Holy Spirit, right? So humanity, humanity's will, so to speak, was joined to the will of God. And that was the pivotal moment for our salvation. So that, that's why we are supposed to conform ourselves to the will of God. And we fight against it over and over and over because we're fallen because of original sin. And sure. so the whole point of the spiritual life is to shrink our will. It's like, it's what John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must, I decrease. must decrease. That's really yeah. what it's all about. Well, and that's honestly where you find joy. You know, I mean, I'm, yes. you know, I'm happier in my life than I've ever been. Um, and, and my life is very different than it used to be when I was chasing things that I thought would make me happy. Um, but it, it is, I mean, for men and, and women, you know, all together, it's hard because it doesn't make sense when you go, well, hey, put other people first, die to yourself. Like all that stuff sounds horrible, right? It's like, who wants that? Like I want grapes and somebody fanning me and like, you know, a cooler full of beer to my right at any time, you know, whatever. But, but in the end of it is, it's like, no, it's that self-sacrifice and that giving up of my desires. It doesn't mean that you don't, you know, you, there's not things in your life that you want and that you pursue and all that stuff. It just means that, that I realize, as Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, right? It's that call to humility, putting other people first and living the way that Christ lived. And that's what I think sometimes we can miss is he, he didn't just come ha down here just to die for us. He gave us the model of what we're supposed to live and be like, right? The perfect man. And, and so, as Jesus said, I, I, Lord, I love about him is he didn't mince words, right? He didn't say it's going to be a cakewalk. It's going to be easy. It's going to be no problem. I'm doing all the heavy lifting and y'all don't have to worry about anything. You know, you will have to suffer. You will be persecuted. They will hate you because they've hated me. You know, there's all of those tough things. But in the midst of it all, if you can get past that and you start doing the things that you've talked about here, then you start coming into that, that realization that it's not about my will. It's about his will. And coming into that conformity, as you talked about, is what's going to bring you a happier and joyful life. And happiness is the key. You said it. I'm happier now than I've ever been. Why? Because you've learned more deeply how to give of yourself. And the reason why that makes you happy is because you're emulating in your own life the life of the family that you were made for, right? The Trinity itself is a communion of persons who give of themselves one to another. And so the more we learn to do that, the more we're being formed and made ready for that divine family that we were made for. That's why you find fulfillment and satisfaction only when you give of yourself because you were made to do that. The only reason we don't is because of original sin. So that's what the whole spiritual life is all about, is trying to get rid of the effects of original sin that keep us from making a gift of ourselves to others. And we don't like to do it because no, we, I, we kind of, we equate you know, self-gift with destruction, like somehow where we're lessening ourselves when we yep. give ourselves away. That's not it at all. That's when you find yourself. You know, Vatican II talks about this clearly. You, you find ourselves when you make a gift of yourself. And, and that's what it's all about because that's the life of God. And that's the life that we were made for. We talked before about how God really is our father. We're really made for that family. Like the yeah. end goal the, of spiritual life is literal divine life. You are being divinized through this process of the spiritual life. And, and it's language that a lot of Catholics, we, we don't really bandy that about. We talk about the life of grace a lot, but we don't talk about divinization, like deification. Yeah. 
literally that's what's happening because you're being made for the divine life, the divine family of, of God. And that's why we find that satisfaction in self gift. And that's why we're happy when we do it. It's better to give to receive than receive, right? It's not a Hallmark card. That's from the book of Acts. You know, that's yeah. the inspired you know, word. <laughs> telling us, this is how you should live. And this is where you're going to be fulfilled. And this is the key to your salvation. Not my will, but thine be done. Amen. And uh, somebody, I think it was Bill Donahue, he was on here a while ago and he was talking about, we were talking about Marvel movies and all the superhero stuff and all that. And he said, is it any wonder we're, we're drawn to superpowers because we were made to have them. We were made for them. Yes. And he's basically talking about what you're saying just in a you know Marvel kind of nerding out way. But like, <laughs> but, that's, <laughs> but that's exactly what he was saying is like, we long for these things that we don't even realize that we long for them because we were made for them. Yeah, no, the, the, the end goal is beyond our wildest dreams. This is why St. Paul says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, right? And Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. It's no longer I who live, but but Christ who lives within me. What's he saying? He's saying he's being deified and divinized as Christ is unified with him. We can't fathom what that's like. Yeah. You know, we, we look at these Marvel movies, you know, you're like, wow, look at how cool that place is, you know, whatever Guardians of the Galaxy, whatever, and the, the different places they're flying around. If some yo-yo in Silicon Valley in jeans, you know, and a, and a tank top and flip flops can create that on his computer, what can the God of the universe make for us who are willing to give ourselves to him? It's going to blow mm -hmm. your doors off, you know, and, and Romans eight seventeen says we are co-heirs with him if we suffer with him provided we suffer with him why so we also may be glorified like him what mm -hmm. what god has if we make our way through this fallen world with yucky at times and is hard at times it's hard a lot of times it's so worth it you know it's so it, like what else is that like what are you going to live for otherwise what, you want a better yeah. bigger truck you want a bigger f1 you want f250 instead of a 150 i mean come on right <laughs> i mean it, it's ludicrous the things that we lay ourselves out for when what god is offering us is so astounding like it, it, it it's mind-boggling when you ponder this he wants us to be part of his divine family yeah. that's crazy john it's crazy it is. It is. And we're stuck in the things that we, we can get here and now and tomorrow that'll never even oh, we're such hold morons, a candle man. to it. <laughs> so, well, Matthew, let's talk about, like, I, I guarantee you there's going to be people that are inspired by this and want to know more. So obviously you have the, the uh, science of sainthood. Tell us a little bit more about that, how people can get involved in it, everything about it. I'd love to. Thanks. Um, Scienceofsainthood.com. It's basically a, a set of 20 courses at present that are short video courses. I'd make them as beautiful as possible or professionally produced that walk a person step by step through the spiritual life based around these three stages that we just talked about. That's how the spiritual writers write them up. Like these are the things you deal with in the first part. And here's how you get through them. This is what you're going to experience. And it just goes step by step by step through the different courses. And it just kind of lays it out from A to Z and gives a lot of practical pointers for how it is that you go about it. And that's that's really become kind of my life work because I know it transformed my life. And once you uh, start diving into it, you realize this is what it's all about. And, yeah. and this is it's transformed my life. And so I, I love to share this with other people, even as I'm trying to work my way through it but it'll change everything about your life. And uh, I, I ripped the title of Science of Sainthood off from St. Augustine. I didn't come up with it myself because the saints talk about there's a science to it. Like there's a process. Mm -hmm. It's not a free for all. You don't become a saint just by treading water. You have to do what it is you need to do and know what's gonna come your way and know how to use the grace of God as it comes so you don't waste it. So that's really what it's all about. It's about spiritual formation for regular Catholics at scienceofsainthood.com. Scienceofsainthood.com. Awesome. And they can just jump in at any time. There's no start dates, any of that. They can just get into it whenever and start. Yep. It's all, you're right. It's all self paced. And uh, you, we're just getting ready to launch, you know, certificates for all the courses that you complete. And there's some free trial stuff up there. If you go to scienceofsainthood.com, you can opt in and get it, uh, you know, a free course to check it out to see. And no credit cards, no cancellation, nothing like that. But you can jump in and see what it's all about. Awesome. All right, tell us about your podcast, because I know you've got that going, too. Yeah, the Art of Catholic Podcast. Uh, I bring on uh, Catholic luminaries like John Edwards, and we talk about <laughs> uh, various things in the Catholic Must have life. Must an off and it's week. Really... <laughs> <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> no, your, your, uh, your, your witness was fantastic. And uh, yeah. I, I tend to, I don't want to, it's not, um, 
it's kind of like this. I mean, we're talking about real stuff, right? Like the real ins and outs of the Catholic faith, a lot of things that most people have never talked about. And there are a lot of people who are on their way into the church or converts or people just are getting back into their faith that uh, listen to it because it's formational right? and, and, but yeah. in a light and kind of breezy way. Like I just, if we're not joyful in our faith, if we're not having fun with it, dude, we're morons because yeah. we should be the happiest people on the face of the earth, but we don't have to have frowns on because we're Catholics. We should have smiles <laughs> on our faces and be loving the faith that we have. And that's what it's about. All right. So it's Art of Catholic. You've said your, your website is MatthewLeonard.com, correct? The personal site's Matthew S. Leonard, but uh, just send people to scienceofsainthood.com. Matthew S. Leonard.com is where I have like speaking engagement stuff and things like that. My schedule, upcoming appearances, but scienceofsainthood.com is where it's all at. All right. And you mentioned speaking, so I'm plugging you as much as I can, brother, because I know you're a good friend and, and you're a joy to have in. I've had you in Memphis and you did a three talk uh, mission here in Memphis. It was wonderful. People, people still talk about it. And so speaking, you're doing conferences. What else? Parish missions, conferences, um, my own little, I'm, I'm starting to move toward my own little science of sainthood uh, conferences as well. But uh, the podcast and producing things for the science of sainthood and is really kind of the, the, the bread and the butter. Uh, that's where um, I just want to be able to convey the spiritual life and the joy that sure. I found in it to other people. Awesome. Well, Matthew, man, first of all, thank you for taking the time to come on here. You're always a treasure trove of knowledge. And what I love about it, like I said before, is that you, you simplify it. Not that your teaching is simple, but you make it easily approachable for people that may have not heard of it or people that have and have struggled with these things. So thank you for that. Thank you for the your yes and the gift of your life, man. And personally, just on a side note, thank you for being my friend, man. It's really awesome to get to spend time with you and to walk with you. Right back at you, my friend. And God bless all your work for men and Catholic men. Listen, it's time to rise up. We've been a sleeping giant for way too long. We got to get serious about our spiritual lives so that we can lead ourselves and our families, our friends, and even our enemies uh, into the arms of Almighty God. Amen. Folks, check him out at scienceofsainthood.com. Matthew, thank you for being here. Love you, brother, and I'll talk to you soon. Love you too, Johnny. See ya. All right. See you. Bye.